Hi, I'm Mark Jenkins, author of the book Analog Synthesizers, and tonight we're at the Barbican London in connection with the 10th anniversary of the book, speaking to members of the band Survive, Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein, best known of course for their music for the TV show Stranger Things. Before Stranger Things happened, most of the people that would come to our shows were also making electronic music with similar gear of some sort. And we had a few fans, but it was mainly just people who were kind of into the genre and we were like, oh shit, these guys are bringing out a bunch of synths. I want to go see that. Mm -hmm. And then once the show came out, it was, it opened it up to a whole new crowd of people that don't have any idea what's going on. And they just, now they have a way to connect with the music. Yeah. So you were doing uh, workshop things like, did you do the Moog Fest before? Uh, the TV show came out, or yeah, we played the Moog Fest yeah, when it was still in Asheville. Um, survived it, and then we also played it two Just years two. later after the show. So we did we did a different version of this. The the ver we did the Stranger Things show there from season one. Yeah, and we also did a Survive show, and then we did a we did a little like. Q&A thing with Dave Smith, where we just mm -hmm. went up there and played with Prop of Six. It's fantastic. So yeah. funny enough, we do like kind of have like an approach to carrying on, bringing out a lot of equipment and performance, being like performance synth the group. And um, the first Moog Fest year, we we came out. We ran into Malcolm Cecil, so we invited him yeah. to come to our show. He was really and excited. he came he was, out and he was, he was stoked and he was like, I could hear all these top melodies in my head and he's like, you guys are carrying on the tradition of that was really like, special. I guess some then, from moment of the seventies, you know, that he remembered, which was and then on our way back from such the, on a our way back great from, gesture. I'm sorry, just it was just it was really such an honor him. and he was yeah. yeah he was very kind and we hung out with him all night and told us <laughs> a bunch of stories like it was very fun. Yeah, it was great. And then after that, it was kind of a... That was the first trip where where people kind of... This is before any of the Stranger Things stuff, but that was the first tour where we kind of got to meet some of the people that we have been, like, looking up to for a long time. Because on the way back from that trip, we played with Goblin. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. And Same. they came and watched us, and they were... They were like... We, we played after... There was, like, an front. after show after they played... And um, they came and watched us, and they were like, "Yeah, like Wonderful. up front." And that was like, that was pretty incredible. And people talk about John Carpenter and, and so on. What what are the artists we? There's a bit to? of John Carpenter, but for me, the main reason that I wanted to start this band is because of one song specifically called "Mass" by Yellow Magic Orchestra. Oh, cool. Off of um, BGM. Yeah. That was like. When I heard that album, I had been listening to Aphex Twin and all that stuff growing up, so I was... When I heard YMO, I, I was like, this is... They were doing the same things in the early 80s. I mean, it's not the same by any means, but as long as... As far as, like, the textures and the sounds... It's still and fresh. The, and the kind of... Yeah, and the... Like... The, the per percussion and, the, and how, like, the level of complexity there... I was like, holy shit, this has been going yeah. on for a long time, and that was kind of a revelation for me. And that song just kind of has like a, a toughness or like a seriousness to it that really kind of Fantastic. drove you it. And then some of Space our, Art was a yeah. huge influence. Space Art? Yeah. yeah. Space oh, Art. Wonderful. Yeah, Space Art, big influence. If I had to pick two bands that it would be Space Art and like, not all YMO, but like a few YMO songs specifically. Did just you listen really, to like a YMO album and then you listen to one of our albums you'll probably pick out like we like to use a lot of uh, like FM like percussive Ring mod, like, kind of like heavy awesome. but tonal sounds to where they're they're so FM and like kind of ring mod that they sound like musical notes but there's a tonal because of the nature of that kind of that kind of synthesizer patch the first synth that I bought it wasn't I don't even really consider it a real synth anymore. I mean, it was. I just typed an analog synth on eBay and it came up. It was a, a mini Korg, uh, the Univox yeah, um, mini, -Korg. mini Korg. Oh, okay. I got that, but that, and, but it's you know it's kind of a preset synth, but it has a really that really great filter. And the first real synth that I got was, was a Monopoly. 
Mm. Record Monopoly. Yeah, I like. I bought a bunch of stuff that was synthesizers and wasn't really getting along with them quite right, feeling them until I got a SH101, the Roland, and I was like, oh, this this analog sound is definitely the thing I'm more into that I hear on a lot of records I like. And then I just started kind of building like a modular system, like the when 5 u was a little more popular, like the DIY scene was around. So I started doing that and then oh, that kind of just lent me to researching a lot all the time about finding out, like reading books like these to find out what each yeah. synth and what made the filters different in the circuits and trying to replicate that. And then eventually I was like, wow, I've spent so much money on these little individual things. I'm just going to buy a synthesizer yeah. that can make, do the whole thing. That's you like $600. Dollars. Yeah. Like, so I'm glad I went and had my like synth binge before yeah. the heyday of the prices of today because Absolutely. like owning some of the stuff I have now would just be like ridiculous. To yeah, I think off. I paid six hundred and fifty dollars for the Monopoly and now they're like two thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. We keep we've requested twenty six hundreds and because we have them. Yes. But like the idea of going and buying one of those is I was using the arpeggiator on the Monopoly a lot because I didn't really have a good way to sync things up. We were using MPC for some MIDI stuff, but I hadn't really figured out how to clock anything. I remember I came so out and they were sending audio out of their MPCs as like clicks. Yeah. Um, I remember being like, didn't really send like a. Well. So I, then I would bring out my Mo, this future retro Mobius sequencer oh, yeah. with me. It would be one of the things I would drive up to Austin with so that we so could we send could out like S trigs, V trigs, and program gates to the MPC so that we had the MIDI triggers. But yeah, yeah. But typically it would just at least on a couple of those things it was just they don't touch like, don't touch the arpeggiator or don't touch the rate on the arpeggiator. Just when, that track, track, yeah. Yeah. when I was into the first album, the stuff that I would say they were recording a lot more stuff that way. I'm like, wow, that this stuff sounds really interesting. The way it's it not gives it a nice uh, a weird. Back then, they were using Logic back then, which I would confuse me at the time. But I was using Pro Tools. And I had Pro Tools set up where I could like go make a MIDI track and select through like a M Audio, like I could select in my room like SH one hundred and one, and it was like a MIDI CV converter for like five or six different synths. Yeah. So I could like pick them as if they were soft synths, and like control them and do all the MIDI sequencing in the computer, which is actually I'm only now coming back to that way of work. It was pretty efficient. Like that's how like I kind of created a good system in the very beginning and then I just completely ditched. Yeah, we both got MPCs around the same time. And we <laughs> and just, just switched like, to MPCs. We just learning how to use them Yeah. at the same time because there's a pretty steep learning curve on, on the MPC. It took, I feel like, eight months before I kind of really understood it because it's, yeah. it's a weird old computer, essentially. <laughs> we can talk about a VR project we're on. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's really It's very cool. It's called Spheres. Sphere's Songs of Space Time is the first one. The second one is called Pale Blue Dot. So it's virtual reality, it's an Oculus Rift headset. It's, um, it's a three-part series um, about the universe. Uh, there are short, film, or there are short films, they're like 13 minutes each. The first one is about black holes, so you get to witness the birth of a black hole and then you actually go through a black hole in virtual reality and then hole. yeah and then you become a black hole and you swallow a bunch of stars and, <laughs> and another black hole and then there's cool. things called gravitational waves which supposedly make up the universe and so there's a very interactive piece at the end of um, at the end of that where you kind of bring in different layers of of the of the sounds and you can manipulate them. You were saying about um, basically getting FM type sounds out of analog synthesizers. Yeah. Is that uh, something that the ARP Trent Six Hundred does particularly well? Well, yeah, it's the only synth that really does it super complex way where you can cross mod all the oscillators without patch cables. You literally I just think my turn favorite, up. I think my favorite one is the Solus, though. For some sound reason, wise, for some reason, it just sounds so crazy. Like it sounds so gnarly, like a mm. like a crazy guitar. We yeah. use that a lot. I used to play that live 
Yeah, the early harps have this, um, not that one, I don't believe, but like the Soulless and Odyssey. They have a logic chip for the ring mod. Oh, yeah. So it's not actually like a traditional ring mod. Yeah, yeah. And so it sounds sound. freaking weird. It's like, it distorts. Cool. It kind of sounds rectified. It's like, oh, okay. It's, it's got this really aggressive behavior. And that sounds really cool with the, when you get the oscillators beating, yeah. it almost does some amplitude modulation where things look as well. Fantastic. Foof, foof, foof. Yeah. I don't know, you just get these really cool textures with the, the FM dark stuff. Oh, I, I still play the Monopoly, the first Monopoly that I bought. He plays his 101. Yeah. yeah. We've got, I mean, we've, we've changed had, it up. We've but, had SH5 you know, on stage. We had, a, we've had, we had I used RSO to bring out a modular. We had RSO9 for a long time. Six, there was one point where we were all playing six tracks. We all four had six tracks, which is weird. Poly 6 came, Poly became six. too unreliable, so we got rid of that one. So I got rid of, but... We had an SH5. Um, yeah, the, been, the lineup is... It's changed a lot, but that, I mean, the Survivor Show is... Well, now we're now that Korg has remade the um, the Odyssey, yeah, they were, they were, they were kind old. enough to give us the full set, like, a set of the full size oh, yeah. um, Odyssey, so... And I love play, it. We play those a lot. Because if I'm playing bass, I can go to the MK1 filter, which is, like, the best one for bass. Yeah. If I'm playing, like, a lead sound, I might want to play, like, the MK3. We came from an experimental background, so the show will definitely be very much that. I mean, it also includes the melodic themes yeah, sure. and things like that, but we wanted to to do, like, because just the idea of doing a show, we never planned on playing Stranger Things music live. It felt a little bit cheesy to, like, if we brought the logo out and, like, there were all these ideas about trying to, like, have cast members or people dress up like characters or the Demogorgon or something. I mean, we didn't really want to do that. We wanted to kind of keep it to where it didn't feel like we're selling out completely. So we wanted to keep a lot of the the weirder textural stuff because there's a lot of that in the show that sure. that gets, I don't know if it gets overlooked, but... Or maybe it just doesn't get as much, it, it's so much of the bedding or like it moves the the story, the story of the show and when you're kind of like being terrified or something.